Okay, Barb has just arrived, running a little bit late, and I actually got contacted by a couple of folks asking if we were going to live stream this. Uh, but because of uh, Barb arriving a little bit later, I decided I would shoot this video, and then we would do a live chat in a couple of days. So I'm going to start the class, and I've got to go up and let Barb in, so I'll be right back. Mine. It's behind the partition. Oh, we're gonna, yeah, we're okay. going to be dramatic. Come on over and sit down and make yourself comfortable. So overall, a good trip, huh? Except that I lost an hour somewhere. <laughs> you were in the twilight zone. <laughs> well, I should know better. The same thing happens when I go see my granddaughter in Wausau. She's only 26 miles from me. It takes sure. me over an hour to get there at 70 miles an hour. And I'm like, all right, tell me what's wrong here. Oh, my gosh. Well, welcome to Barb uh, at the workshop, and uh, she literally just asked as she was coming down here, she said, all right, where's the machine? And she looked on the other workbench, I'll kind of go past Barb here, and right behind Barb on the workbench you can see is a FOF 130-6 that I'm going to be premiering shortly that's going to uh, Texas. I was and just in Texas. Where in Texas were you? Uh, near uh, Fort Worth, Dallas. Okay, sure. A little suburb that area. I forgot the name. <laughs> well, interestingly enough, the machine right behind you that is kind of a repeat, it's almost like a rewind of sorts. Uh, Alberto, who is a retired teacher, I'll kind of zoom in on the machine if you want to just lean a little bit to that side. No, you're fine. So this machine right here, I'll just show you guys and then I'll come back out so Barb doesn't get a crick in her neck. Uh, but that machine right there is actually heading to the Dallas area as well. Yeah, yeah, that's going to head to Dallas. This gentleman, um, gosh, this is over a year ago, uh, got in contact with me, said he wanted to get a 130. I talked about the 130 that has the embroidery kit on the back of it, so you can do all kinds of decorative stitching. He says, that sounds fabulous. So I ended up getting the machine done, eventually premiering it, sending it down to Dallas. His sister saw it, and she said, Alberto, I want one of those too. So he, he contacted me back. He said, you know, I know it's a pretty rare machine with the embroidery. You don't have another one, do you? I said, as a matter of fact, I do. <laughs> he said, sold. My sister wants it. So uh, there you go. But I'm going to zoom in on the laptop and we'll look at the pictures of the machine when it first arrived at the workshop. I'll turn the screen around. I'll have to adjust this again, I'm sure. All right, let me come in on the camera a little bit. So this is the machine that Barb brought to the workshop. It's obviously a Class 66, a red eye. And as we look at some of the more detailed pictures, you'll see some of the challenges with the, uh, particularly with the paint patina. Uh -huh. Oh wow, that looks awful, doesn't it? So a lot of crackling on the paint surface on uh, Barb's machine when it arrived at the workshop. And that's a product of uh, 
usually moisture working its way underneath uh, the clear coat. Uh, but what also can cause it, or at least cause the, uh, the uh, clear coat to open up a little bit so that it can be more vulnerable is sometimes if folks will use certain chemicals to clean the surface of the machine, it can reduce the effectiveness of the clear coat protecting the paint and then once it's compromised it's, it's just like a virus, it just kind of works its way through. And just what this shot is showing is the raceway area, just kind of general cleanliness. Uh, whenever a machine comes in for uh, a service, repair, an improvement, or whatever, uh, I always make it a point of going through the machine from bobbing the balance wheel and doing a deep cleaning as well so that all the mechanisms on the machine are going to work as well as possible. And kind of back to the paint again, and you can see all over the bed of the paint and also near the top as well, we've got this uh, pervasive crackling issue. And I know a couple of you said when I showed a, a little clip of this machine uh, that, well, doesn't that kind of add character to the machine? It does, but when you get crackling like this, just like on the bed of this foff that's right behind Barb, what it can do as well is that those little paint flecks can kind of chip away. And then as you're doing sew-offs and you're using material over the bed, you can actually pick up little paint ch chips and it, and it kind of can also snag the material as well if, the, uh, if it's a satin or a silk or even cotton. So you have to just be aware that it, it can also be not just an aesthetic issue, but can also be a functional issue as well. There's more of that. Almost looks like a broken mirror, doesn't it? But that's all clear coat and it's, where, wherever you see the, uh, the cracking, it's exposing the uh, the uh, paint underneath, which is never a good thing on a machine. You see more of it there. Another angle. And there you can see the cereal plate. And I've got to make a, an apology to all of you. When I recently was talking about Barb's machine, and I, I did a little mini tutorial on how to look up a serial number. Um, and we're going to do that right now, as a matter of fact. I'll kind of pop away from this for a second, and we'll do that. Um, I made an error, because when Singer summarizes their letter um, serial numbers, Barb's, for example, starts with a G. 99.99% um, .99 of the time, kind of like all the chemicals that are supposed to kill viruses right now, they're 99.99% effective. Well, singers sometimes would change their gears and how they would present those serial numbers where they were not truly sequential. I'll show you what I mean. And it's how I made my error. And thankfully, due to Paula and Emma uh, digging a little bit deeper during the premiere, uh, they discovered that with that particular letter series of G, the letter series, you've got to scroll all the way to the bottom, and then you can find the correct uh, bracket breakout for this particular serial number. So let's do that right now, and I'll show you how I looked it up at first and how I ended up uh, making a mistake. What do I have there? That's different, guys. I was looking at that in preparation. So again, when you're looking up a serial number, um, all you want to do, I'm just making sure the shot shows it, all you want to do is type in uh, Singer, assuming it's a Singer, yes. Serial Numbers, hit enter, and the first one that comes up is the one that I recommend most highly, it's called ismax.net. Uh, they are about as bulletproof as possible when it comes to um, accurate dating of Singer sewing machines. I guess their official title is Ismax International. So as we scroll down, as I explained in that live premiere, any Singer sewing machine that predates 1900 is only going to be numbers. There's not going to be uh, any letter prefix in the serial number, I had to adjust my camera a little bit. I was off there a little bit. So with uh, with 
Barb's machine having a letter in front of it, we know right away that the machine is older than 1899. It's going to be 1900 or older because it has a letter in front of it. And the letter we're looking for is G. So let's go ahead and scroll down. We'll keep scrolling down. Lots of letter prefixes. You can see some of them are double letters and some are single letters. So we're just going to keep going down until we get to G. There it is, G series serial numbers. So I'm going to go ahead and click that. And they're giving us a little advertisement, which we'll, we'll go ahead and close that. There we go. So the serial number that we're looking for on Barb's machine, let me just check my lineup again. These pages kind of shift a little bit sometimes, and I want you to see what we're wanting to see here. All right, come a little bit wider. Okay, you should still be able to see that easily enough. So the serial number that we're looking for on Barb's machine is G0291716. So as I start to scroll down, I know that it's gotta be a seven digit number and all of these are six digit numbers right now so we've got to go further down and since this particular serial number starts with a zero it should be at the very beginning sequence of the seven digits once we reach them right so we're going to keep on going still in six digits a lot of scrolling huh we're still scrolling Maybe I should put on some scrolling music. Hold on a second. <laughs> Where is it? There it is. Oh, this is definitely scrolling music if I've ever heard scrolling music before. Let's go over here. There we go. Okay, let's keep on scrolling. This is scrolling music. Actually, perfect scrolling music. Now we're in the 700 series, you can see, but we still only have six digits. And our serial number again is 0291716, which is seven digits, so we've got a little ways to go yet. 800 now. 900. And finally, here, if you look real close, you can see we have 967001, and then we all of a sudden launch into seven digit numbers that they're starting with one. So normally, the way you would read this is that between this, these two numbers, this bracket, you're going to find 0291716 because 029176 is obviously greater than this number and less than this number. And it is in fact a 66, a model 66 is what Barb has, 40,000 made, born on January 16th, 1911. But here's where Singer pulled a, pulled a whammy on us and tricked us a little bit. They ended up deciding, like an odometer on a car. Say, for example, you have a car, and uh, this was an odometer. 100700. Number one, you've, you've done a lot of driving. But what they decided to do is, instead of following the normal bracket principles of the six-digit transition into seven digits, our number's in the middle of those. This is our machine, which, you know, again, we have a class 66, so that would make sense. They decided to go all the way through the seven digit series, and then, as if the odometer were completely turning over from 999999999, then they went to zero. So we have to scroll, and this is what Emma and Paula dis uh, discovered. We have to scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll all the way through all of these seven digit numbers before Singer decided on the very bottom to go back into the zero series after all these numbers rolled over. Let me see if I can go through these a little quicker. You kind of see why I didn't bother to go to the bottom looking for another number when we found that one on top. Seemed reasonable. It should have been that one. It should have been that one for sure. And I'm still 
questioning, you know, whether they goofed up, but well, we know it's we know it's a class 66, and so that would make sense that it would be that top one born in 1911. Okay, we're almost there. You can see now we're in to all seven digits, and we're in the 900 series, which means we're just about to turn that over and hit zero. And according to this summary on Ismax, that's where our machine is. Almost there. Almost there. And finally, let's see here. Nope, not quite yet. That's not it. A little bit further. Let's see here. Look at that. We're still going. We're looking for 029. This was really goofy. I've never seen uh, a letter um, summary set up like this before. It's very, very strange. So, all the way after all of that scrolling, down here they're showing a different breakout. 0262776 through 0312775. So we know that our number, 029, would fall between these two numbers according to this bracket breakout which is different than the one way at the top but this one is also showing it as a class 66 here instead of 40,000 they're showing 50,000 were made and here they're showing a birth date of August 27th 1923 so we have a 12 year discrepancy between what would be a logical breakout way at the top that I already showed you where it places the machine in 1911 and then we have a 12 year lapse where they show another breakout with the same serial number in between these two numbers they're showing a different group size of 50,000 instead of 40,000 and then they're giving an entirely different birth date of August 27th 1923 all I can conclude from this is one of two things and I actually had a chat with Paula about this as well she said it it didn't make sense to me either uh, the bracket breakout on top would fit the machine perfectly putting it in 1911 and then she said I just decided to scroll down further to see if they had any serial numbers uh, starting with zero and then I found this down here so either they decided with this G series to go like I said all the way through the seven digit series all the way to 9999999 and roll it over to one like an odometer and then present these at the very bottom or there's an error on this data system. But we know the machine was either born in 1911 or 1923 based on the two entries on this page. Um, I, I guess if you have any opinions on that, type it in the chat and uh, let me know what your thoughts are on it. But in any case, we've got a very, very fabulous Class 66 machine, whether it was 1923 or 1911, uh, that uh, has gone through a transformation. Let's look, let's go back to those pictures again. And thank you again to Paula and uh, Emma uh, for bringing this to my attention. So here we have that mysterious serial plate that has caused a little bit of confusion and controversy with uh, the 029716. Uh, is it 1911? Is it 1923? You type in the chat 1911 or 1923 based on what I've shown you and um, and then it'll be up to the owner when she tells the story of this machine and its transformation whether she wants to say 1911, 1923. I would agree with both based on this database the way they have the brackets broken out etc. So, uh, But you can see here that serial plate is really tough to read. It's got a lot of veneering, a lot of varnishing on it. Uh, really really tough to read. And uh, if you saw my Facebook post on this, um, when you clean up a plate like this, you have to really take it layer by layer by layer. And if you use two of, a, of an aggressive path, like uh, a real aggressive chemical or something like that, because you get impatient, what it'll do is it'll eat up the paint that is embedded into these letters. These are stamped letters, so they've got a little bit of depth to them and they're infilled with black paint to make them easier to see. So if you go too deep or you're too aggressive using a, a chemical or something, what's going to happen is you're going to end up 
pulling that paint out of there and then you're going to have to do what I showed you in another premiere where you have to use um, uh, a, a, a real strong either an epoxy uh, or you could also use an enamel and kind of fill that back in and then wipe it clean and then let that paint set set in again so that you can read those letters more easily the letter and the, the numbers I should say so here you can see as I'm getting it ready to go to the paint shop and I was actually as Barb and I were communicating today I was actually down at the paint shop so I was like racing back and and uh, we ended up timing it perfectly where I was able to get back and get things settled get everything set up and then Barb arrived shortly after that but uh, when I'm getting ready to take a machine down to the paint shop, I've got to take all the hardware off of the machine because I don't want to get uh, any uh, clear coat on that stuff or it'll, it'll totally mess up the machine. And here you can see across the top of the arm, and some of you have seen these pictures already before, uh, but that typically is either someone uh, you know, picking the machine up by the arm of the machine, which would make sense, or they might have had a wrap on there with pins in it. Uh, usually when there's pins on it, it, it's even nastier than this. It'll go all the way down to the bare metal as they're jamming the pins in and out. But here we've got scratching nonetheless. And that was part of the area I wanted to target as well. There's our stitch length control on the right side of the machine. When you screw it all the way in, you'll get the longest stitch possible, which is going to be about six stitches per inch. When you turn it counterclockwise, uh, to as far as it will come out, you'll be right around 25 to 30 stitches per inch. So screwed all the way in, you get a long stitch. Turn clock, uh, counterclockwise all the way out, you get a much shorter stitch, depending on what you want. And the, the challenge with this, and it's part of the reason that eventually the Class 66 models replaced this stitch length knob with a lever that was numbered, because then the customer, the owner of the machine, could see exactly where they were setting it. With this one, unless you count the revolutions and treat it like a clock, it's a little bit of spitballing if you end up making an adjustment and you go, okay, I changed it to around 10 stitches per inch, but now I want six. How far do I turn it back the other way? You know, if I'm at 10 and now I want to go to six, then I'd have to turn it in clockwise, but how far do I go? And so there's some guesswork in trying to match those stitch lengths up, which is why eventually the Class 66 went to a lever that was numbered which was a lot easier for for the owner in the end but my point in showing this also is just uh, we've got some uh, some crud on the front of there looks like a combination of varnishing veneer old oil and uh, just a real flat appearance it doesn't look shiny it doesn't look pretty and there again we're just looking at the balance wheel um, kind of showing you some of the uh, the dirt buildup and stuff. And again, if you go to a local service center, uh, they're not going to touch any of this. If you bring in a dirty, filthy machine, um, and I've asked you guys several times all over the world, if you know of a place that cleans up the machine to the extent that I do, let me know. I'd like to re you know, sh give them a shout out. Never ever in the years that I've issued that challenge have I been told by anybody that another workshop goes to this level. But it, you have to do that because dirt migrates on the machine and especially in this area right here, if you leave all this filth and dirt over here, it's going to eventually work its way onto the rim where that belt rides, and it's going to cause that belt to slip. So you've got to get rid of all the dirt. The dirt is not the friend of our VSM machines. Here we're looking at the back of the pillar, and again, you can just see the chalkiness and the buildup on the paint. Uh, and again, this is one of the most beautiful decal patterns that Singer ever came out with. And it just doesn't present uh, as beautifully as it should, as you can see in this shot. So that's another thing that I wanted to, to target for Barb. And as I like to say, get it standing tall and looking good ought to be in Hollywood. Look at all this here. And see that the challenge when you're, when you're mitigating something like this, it's not only the crackling of the clear coat like you can see here, but it's also the filth and everything that has embedded itself then actually onto the paint uh, where the clear coat is compromised. So you're talking about microscopic surgery almost and getting all of that crud off of the surface and then preparing that surface to receive new clear coat without damaging the, uh, the decals, which are, I mean, they're rice paper thin. And the only thing protecting them 
is the clear coat that's compromised. You, you see what I'm saying? It's a real tricky process uh, in trying to resolve something like this. It's not a matter of just cleaning it. It's not a matter of, of hitting it with new clear coat because then the surface would look awful because all that dirt would then be uh, trapped underneath the clear coat and it would show through uh, straight away. So here again, we're just looking at a little bit more of that crackling over here by the pillar. And I've got to keep track because eventually we might go full circle and I don't want to show the same thing twice. That would be kind of silly. More crackling. You can see how the crackling is right in proximity to these decals. So it's a, it's a real tedious process. I don't think we've gone full circle yet. Here's more of the breakdown of the clear coat and also where the dirt has just worked its way underneath the surface. Think of it almost like if you get an injury on your hand, you're going to clean it and then you're going to put a band-aid over it so it can heal, right? Right now our band-aid is, is, is torn off because the clear coat is compromised. And here we're looking near the raceway again. Remember we were talking about that plate that goes over the feed dogs and it go, goes over the throat plate, the one right here that kind of sets down there? Look at all the buildup on the edges. And again, that plate is not going to seat down properly if all of that isn't removed so that it's all the way down and you're getting the full benefit of the feed dogs. Right now, it's going to be pushed up probably only about a millimeter or so, but that still makes a difference in stealing away some of that feed factor from the machine. Here we're kind of looking into the raceway and you can look at the uh, the feed dogs there they've also got a lot of buildup on them and so this all this whole area this is the brain center of the machine where the stitches are created has to be uh, properly cleaned up. Here we're looking at uh, part of the hook system and then also the bobbin carrier. Remember on the 66 you have a drop-in bobbin so you don't have a bobbin carrier uh, or a bobbin case that you take in and out it's mounted into the machine. Do any of you know what kind of hook system the Class 66 has? And the hook system is going to be, again, either a rotary hook system where the hook goes completely around and around and around and around, or an oscillating hook system. Which one do you think it is? Type in the chat whether you think the Class 66 has a rotary hook system or a, um, an oscillating hook system. I won't even try to tease you with long beak shuttle because you wouldn't buy that. You guys are too smart. But uh, the one thing I will tell you is this Class 66 was eventually replaced by another machine that had a totally different hook system. And if any of you know that, you're going to get an A in the class today and brownie points. And uh, I don't know, maybe Barb and I will mail you a bar of chocolate or something. You never know because I have extra bars of chocolate in the workshop right now. But I'll give you a few seconds to decide that. We'll put on a little bit more contemplation music as you're trying to guess that answer. Did my music run out? I don't think so. Well, if you didn't get it yet, you probably won't get it. So. I'll tell you that Barb's machine has an oscillating hook system, which means it moves like a pendulum. As it's manipulating the thread, top and bottom, to create the stitch, it goes like this, back and forth, almost like a pendulum on a clock. It doesn't go full circle. But the machine that replaced the Class 66, which was the 201, is a rotary hook system, and the, the machine that replaced Barb's eventually does go full circle because it's rotary versus oscillating like this one. Again, you get to see cleanliness issues. If, if you've got a drop-in bobbin system, you should have this little button right here, which is beautiful because it, what it does is when you push it down, it pops that bobbin up so that you can grab it more easily if you're refilling it or if you're changing out colors or thread type or whatever. <laughs> Never noticed that. Now we're looking at the rear of the machine. And uh, again, on the back of the machine, there's that pretty little plate, and a lot of people never take that pretty little plate off because they see the across the top of the machine there's oiling points, but there's a lot of surfacing that has to be done on here uh, in this area as well, and that's part of what I focus on as well when the machine comes in the workshop. 
just a different shot kind of down the back of the machine. Here you can see the pillar, all the buildup on, on the paint on Barb's machine, and then you can see all the way down that paint is just very, very cloudy, yucky looking. Different angle, again showing you that serial plate. There's our stop action on the end of the balance wheel. Again, you turn that towards you when you want to disengage the clutch to wind a bobbin, and then you turn it to the rear when you want to engage the clutch. And again, like I talked about recently in one of the premieres, on the other side of this stop action, there's a little ring, a metal ring, and you always make sure that those little prongs, there's a prong on either side that engages with the main shaft. Make sure those prongs are, when, that, when it's put on, are pointing out towards you because what happens when you turn this stop action, it compresses those prongs and pushes them into the main shaft, which allows the needle to move. When you turn it the other way, it releases those prongs, and then all that you turn is the balance wheel. Here we're just looking at the top of the machine again, as the music gets dramatic. <laughs> Across the back of the arm, again, you can just see the, the paint quality was really, really rough. Beautiful decals, but they're all being concealed and masked by all the filth and, and uh, by the uh, clear coat being compromised. And that's why they call it the red eye pattern. You can see right there, if you can imagine some of the mystical cartoons and movies that you've seen where they've got a mysterious dragon in a cave or something like that, and usually they'll show a shot into the cave and all you can see is the eyes of the critter. And it would look something like that, just kind of an eerie glow with the red and the green wrap around and then the leafy uh, gold uh, accent on the outside. But that's why they call it the red eye pattern, because of that, that design. Up near the presser foot lever, again just showing the back of the machine. Different shot with our little friend from, where did you guys say she was from? Did you say she was from Holland? I don't remember. And there you can just see, uh, again, some of the parts uh, laid out there. Uh, they never go to the paint shop. They stay here in the workshop because I don't want any overspray or anything like that to get on them. And I've heard of some people trying to clear coat uh, face plates and the rear plate that goes on the rear of the machine. I do not recommend that. Uh, chrome is, is a surface that is best left as it is. If you put clear coat on it, it may give you a little bit of luster for a little bit, but then it's going to start peeling off and create a huge mess for you. And here, if you look real close, you know, up here you can say, oh my gosh, that's such a beautiful faceplate. And it is. It's one of the beautiful scroll patterns that came out in the early 1900s. Uh, but you can see down here in that uh, stippled area, or whatever you would call it, a lot of dirt and stuff is just in there. And that all has to come out as well so that there's nothing distracting from the beauty of that faceplate. Up here as well, if you look real close, you can see all the dirt kind of embedded in that stippling. Oops, I think I just, I went full circle, yay! And I'm going to get rid of the serial numbers because that's a, that's a sore point for me right now. I'm going to send a nasty note to uh, Ismax International and they'll probably never read it, but that's fine. <laughs> so, and that has nothing to do with what we're doing. So, with all of that blah, blah, blahing, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the camera shot now since Barb has been incredibly patient. And I'm going to let her carefully lift that board up and uh, get a first glimpse in the workshop of her machine. You want to lift it or you want me to do it? I'll do it. Yeah, just lift it straight up and you just set it over there on the floor. That's perfect. Okay. All right. A big reveal. Oh my goodness. That's so beautiful. Quite a difference, isn't it? Oh, yes. And again, like I've told all of you, it's not going to be absolutely perfect. It's not going to be um, like a machine that I've taken all the way down to bare metal and then put on brand new paint. This is the original paint on Barb's machine. But you can see all of the crackling, all of the, even the scratching up on the upper arm where the Singer uh, trademark is, right up here on top. 
you can see that the clear coat also helped to fill in those scratches once I prepared the surface as well. So it is a revolutionized machine now. What do you think? Oh, wow. You are an artist. This is just so gorgeous. I'm almost afraid to touch it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to touch it now and actually do some sewing on it which because uh, this is going to be set up as a treadle machine and we don't have the benefit of a treadle uh, table to, to mount it in at this point at least I've got to turn the balance wheel with my finger which is always entertaining especially, <laughs> especially when I did it off camera and I went through three layers of protected full grain leather matter of fact I'll hand out the barb to look at before we actually do some uh, sew wash you can look at the thickness of what your machine went through uh, just turned by my finger. Don't you need certain type of needles for this also? Well, what I use um, and what I have on your machine right now is called a universal needle, which means it's set up to, uh, to be able to sew a wide field of uh, materials. So it's, it's designed to be able to, it doesn't have a leather scarf with a, a, um, a point on it, a, a cutting blade like a leather needle would but it's got a real, real nice point on it, so it goes through the leather, it goes through cotton, it goes through uh, pretty much anything you want to sew, a universal needle, so. You have to go kind of slow, though, don't you? You don't. You don't necessarily need to go slow. As a matter of fact, you can, if you want to even step alongside, I've got a wide shot where I'll move the Singer Repairman and his alligator. Hopefully his alligator's not in a bad mood today. <laughs> and we'll crank off some stitches with this. And why did you guys put out the button here? What's what's you want me to push the button? But I should I should silence the music first so that you can hear what's okay. Hold on a second. These guys always pull little tricky things on me. Okay, music is off. Now what do you want me to do? You want me to push the button and it's got a message. It's got a message for who? Me? Oh, it's got a message for me and Barb. But I if it's what you said you were gonna do, we've already pulled back. The curtain and we can already see the, oh, I'll push it anyway and we'll just pretend like it's still there You guys, why didn't you guys, you guys should have sent me an email or a text because Barb was supposed to push this button before we pulled the car. That's okay. That's okay. It's all good. It's all good. You guys are so silly. <laughs> you guys are so silly. Okay, so now let me see what my camera shot is. And we will actually do some sewing with this machine. Not only is she a looker, but she's also quite a sewer as well. Okay, I'll put on some sewing music. Hopefully I don't get in the way. But I've got the wide shot, you guys, so you can see me turning the machine. That gives you an idea of how easily this machine turns. And once you put it into a treadle table, and you've got the power of that person's leg pushing down on that. The three layers of protective full grain leather is only the beginning of what this machine can do. So you see right now we've got this stitch length controller turned all the way in, which means we're gonna get a larger stitch. Again, if you wanna have a shorter stitch, just turn it counterclockwise. And you can turn it quite a distance. I would say probably, oh gosh, close to an inch, three quarters of an inch, you can turn this counterclockwise to try to get that stitch super teeny tiny but we're gonna mainly be sewing large stitches today oh I didn't ask Barb uh, and I'll show you guys on camera would you like me to uh, cut a piece of this 100% cotton uh, which color the red one the purple the pink the blue and that's a different kind of purple back there it almost looks like an Easter purple I like them all but the red one I think Okay, so I'm going to cut two pieces of, of this red 100% cotton. We'll do that first. And, uh, and that way you can see, not only can it sew heavy duty, 
but it can also sew the lighter side as well. And I'll just do a single strip of it. It's like a road map. You can never fold this stuff once you pull it apart, you know? <laughs> well, I got it! Put it to the side. So here we have two layers of 100% cotton. What we're going to do is we're just going to stitch down them. And uh, again, as you're adjusting your tension on a machine and you go between a wide field of stitching, we may find, since I have it set up right now, the last thing I did was leather, we might have to tweak the upper tension just a little bit, but we'll see. We'll see. All right, are you ready? So... The finger method. Don't try this at home, kids. I'll tell you what, I'm going to pause the music so you can listen to it operate. So again, just make sure your threads are to the rear and then rotate it towards you. Listen. your foot up and just rock it a little bit to draw it into you yep so here's what I noticed is right now my upper tension is set too high to sew cotton and I'll show you guys why why I say that remember the upper tension and I'll actually zoom in on this and, and put it in a position where Barb can see it as well. The upper tension unit, this unit, yeah, the shot is showing. This unit right here is going to be pulling up to define the lock stitch, which when we look at it, you're going to see a lock stitch that is just, wow, fantastic. But when the upper tension is turned up too high, what it does then is it overpowers the bobbin case down here from being able to pull down to define the top stitch. And so right now our top stitch is weak looking. It's weak looking, but I'm gonna make a correction after I zoom in to show you guys to resolve that. And that's what happens when you go between a wide field of stitches uh, and materials, is you can get a weaker top stitch than you want. I'm zoomed in on it real close right now and later uh, Barb will be able to see this as well. So we've got clearly a, a defined stitch, but it's, it's under-emphasized. Go back the other way, too. Totality of the stitching. And when you come on in totality, it's not a bad stitch, but it's not a page 34 stitch. And page 34, again, if you're new to this channel, is my definition of a near perfect stitch. It's perfectly spaced. The definition of the stitch is good, but it's not tight enough. We got a little bit of a loosey goosey thing going on. Now watch watch that lock stitch when I uh, when I flip it over. It's drop dead gorgeous, but it's almost a little bit too pronounced, and that's because that upper tension was too high to sew cotton. And it actually then, then it shrinks the stitching just slightly because it's pulling up too hard. But that is some gorgeous, gorgeous stitching. So the question is, what do we do now? Type in the chat, what do we do if we were going to sew a ton of cotton? Let's just say that, and I don't know what Barb, Barb, what are you going to be sewing primarily, would you say? Uh, probably fibers, cotton mostly. Okay, so if Barb is sewing a lot of cotton, then this is really a great opportunity to show what to do in case she decides to be a rebel and go after leather or something like that, maybe to make a biker's vest. Because <laughs> I don't know much about Barb, but she looks like a Harley girl to me. So, all right, so I'm going to grab this material one more time. Again, this is our top stitch, which is under-pronounced right now. 
So we're going to slide it back underneath the presser foot. Drop that presser foot down. Now type in the chat what I need to do now to try to get that top stitch to be more pronounced like the lock stitch is right now. Again, the lock stitch is, I mean, it's, it's really, really pretty, but it's, it's overly pretty. So if you typed in the chat, Scott, the upper tension is, is too, using too much muscle now. We need to take some of the muscle away from the upper tension. If you said that, then you're absolutely right. So what we have to do is we have to take this upper tension so we can get a balanced uh, stitch output with the top and the bottom and we have to take some of its power away and we do that by taking this and turning it counterclockwise. And there's going to be a little bit of guesswork involved. Matter of fact, I'll move this over a little bit more so that if we have to do a third run to get it just right, we can do that. So I'm going to take away some of its power. Again, if, if we had the opposite then we would turn it to the right, but here we're turning it to the left. So I'm going to run down another stitch line, and uh, we'll see if we can give a little bit more focus and emphasis to that top stitch, okay? All right, here we go. And don't tell me to go faster. I'm going as fast as I can. We're getting there, but I still didn't go far enough yet. We're getting more definition now, and I, I can zoom in on this and show you, but we still have to go further than we did. And in extreme cases, in extreme cases, if we try to back off the upper tension and we're still not getting enough emphasis of the top stitch, what we may have to do is we may have to go into the bobbin case area and actually increase the pull of the bobbin case itself. And there's a, there's two little screws on there. There's a set screw and there's another screw that allows you to adjust the tension for pulling down harder. So we'll see what we think. I'm going to back it off a little bit more but I, I, I think we may have to make an adjustment actually down in the bobbin case if we're going to be sewing a lot of cotton. And that's the benefit of doing something like this. Uh, you remember when we just did that unboxing of Trisha's uh, machine that originally came from Alex over in the United Kingdom. Uh, the feedback she gave is it was a, it's a gorgeous, beautiful machine, but she could never get it balanced for sewing cotton. When uh, Alex had set it up in uh, England, it was set to sew heavier materials, and she could never get that stitch balance. So... We'll, we'll, we'll do one more adjustment we just did. We'll sew one more stitch line. And before Barb leaves the workshop, if I have to, I will increase our bobbin pull so that it, it, we don't have to back this off quite as far. So let's try this one more line and see if we get closer to the stitch balance that we want. Listen to that machine run. I'm even going to shut my fan off. We're, we're almost there, we're almost there, but I'm thinking that I'll probably, I'll probably end up making an adjustment, and I won't do that right now because it takes a little bit more time, and I want to do some more sew-offs with this machine, then I'll do it off camera, and I'll leave the tails on this one so we can see w which is the last one that we just, that we just did. Set this up on the uh, sew off display now. Okay, so the bottom row is the first one we did, the middle row is the next, and then the top row is the last one that we just did. We are really, really close, but I still think I'm probably going to have to make, knowing now that Barb is going to be doing a lot of cotton, I'll probably make one more adjustment and it'll be down in the bobbin case area.
So you can look at all three of those stitch rows, and you know what, when we get this close to it, they don't look bad at all, but because when I look at that top row, I don't have that upside down, do I? The last one we did was that top row, yeah. When we look at that top row, occasionally you can see just a hint of that knot closer to the top than it should be, and that's again because the bobbin case is not pulling down hard enough. It doesn't have enough muscle against that upper tension. But we've got three decent rows of stitching, but we can even make it better. Now look at look at that top row now. I'm gonna get my hand off the camera. Look at that top row now where the camera's pointed right now. You can see those stitches on that top row coming beautifully into form. Uh, but still, it's just a little bit underserved. Just a wee bit underserved. So I will make that adjustment for Barb once we uh, end the premiere and then we'll do some additional stitching and then uh, the machine will be good to go for being set up uh, specifically for lighter cotton. But we are just on the edge of it right there. You can see that top row compared to the bottom one where we really, really were weak on that upper uh, stitch. Now let's turn it over. Again, the risk when you're making adjustments uh, with the upper tension Let's say that your top stitch is underserved, like it was on that first stitch off row on the bottom in particular. Uh, and so you go, well, I remember what Scott said, if, if our top stitch isn't uh, pronounced enough, then what we need to do is we need to back off the upper tension. But if you back off the upper tension too much, what can happen? Type in the chat what can happen. If you said, if, if you back off the upper tension too much, then you can lose clarity on the bottom lock stitch. The lock stitch then on the bottom, if you take away too much of the power from the upper tension, the stitching on the bottom then can all of a sudden become loosey-goosey. So that's the thing you have to keep, keep, uh, you know, keep in mind when you're making adjustments is one thing affects another. If you want to have a, a better defined top stitch, and you take away power from the upper tension like we just did by turning it counterclockwise, you're also taking away emphasis and definition from the lock stitch on the bottom. So you don't want to take it, don't take it too far. So let's see that top row again. I'm going to turn it completely over. Let's see if we took anything away from that lock stitch on the back. I don't think we would have. I think it's still going to be a real solid, and it is. Still a really solid lock stitch on the back which tells us that we could even go further, um, but we're going to do that by adjusting the bobbin case. We're not going to do that by taking more away. Because what happens eventually, if you look at the, the two rows on the bottom and you compare it to the row on the top, I've talked about this before, where if you're just painstakingly, you're backing off that upper tension, you're backing off that upper tension, because you want a better top stitch and you start to get a result like we did well that's all well and good but if you take away too much from the upper tension instead of doing what I'm going to do after the premiere and bump up the bobbin pole a little bit down in the raceway then what happens is you start to lose the alignment of the stitching on the bottom notice if you look real carefully at that top row we still have very good stitch definition but the alignment is just a tiny fraction of an inch, well, not even a fraction of an inch, a thousandths of an inch. It's just slightly up on the right side. Can you see that in the shot? And what that is, is we've taken so much away from the upper tension that it, it, it's still centering that knot, but it's not making that stitch perfectly aligned, which is a product of the tension. So that's why, you know, you back it off, you back it off, you back it off, you start to get a result on top, but you also can steal something away from the bottom. Does that make sense? So that's what we have to guard against, and that's why I'll go ahead and bump up the uh, the bobbin uh, carrier on the on the on the raceway side of the machine. You can see that in particular if you look here on the bottom compared to the top. But see, it doesn't matter because we know what to do. We know what to do to get the result that we want. Okay, all of that blah blah blah. So totality of the stitching on the lock stitch, all of those stitches are certainly are, are passable. And uh, page 34, I would say the top row 
because we started to lose a little bit of the alignment of it because we took so much of the upper tension pull uh, away trying to get that top stitch to be better defined. I would say that the top row is a near page 34. The other two rows, the middle one and the bottom one, are a solid page 34. But again, just realize everything, you know, a cause and effect, as they talk about in science, as you make adjustments on your tension, it's going to get you part of your result, but you might also end up compromising something else. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so let me come out on the wide shot again. So we can see the entire machine. Now I'm going to have to adjust that upper tension back again because we're going to be doing some leather sewing. And if we don't do that, what we're going to find is our lock stitch then because the lock stitch is always more difficult for the machine to produce because it's having to pull that thread back up through the leather with friction and gravity working against it. So the general rule when you're sewing leather is you're probably going to have to bump your upper tension uh, up a little bit higher than you would if you were sewing other materials. Uh, especially considering that we're using a needle that's not a leather needle, it's a universal needle, so it doesn't have the same type of blade cutting point on it that a leather needle does, which means it's going to have a little bit more friction, a little bit more resistance trying to get that thread back up. So let me put some more music on and we will adjust that upper tension back up. We'll do some more leather sewing and then we'll adjust this so it will accommodate uh, cotton sewing primarily. But that's an important thing. If, if for some reason you decide to, uh, to get a machine from someone and your budget doesn't allow you to send it to the workshop and this person says that they're a restorer and they know how to work with the machine, then what you need to do is you need to tell them what you're going to be sewing because that will that will dictate to some extent the type of needle that they set the machine up with, the type of thread, and certainly how they balance the tension factor. Uh, tell them how many layers, tell them what you're going to be sewing, and then they'll set it up like that. So I'm going to give this to Barb so she can look at it more closely and kind of see what we did with this top stitch. We're not quite there. And then the lock stitch on the bottom as well. And I don't know if you use this sometimes, but I do, even though it's dirty. But if you want to use that to magnify it, too, you can do that. That's what I'm using to sew with now. So I am bumping our upper tension back up because we're going to do some leather sewing now. And what I'm going to sew next is what I sewed off camera. And it's just to show again, uh, treadle machines are sometimes given a bad rap. Um... The idea that it doesn't have a motor, right? And Bill would be the first one that would challenge a misconception like this. Oh, I gotta turn my light back on, that's why it's a little bit dark. I shut that off when we're looking at things on the screen. But you can see what we're gonna be sewing next is three layers of protected full grain leather. If you don't know much about leather, kinda of like I didn't know much about it when I first started using it in sew-offs, protected full grain leather has a special coating on it to protect it from staining and also to give it more wearability. So right away when they treat um, when they treat a, a leather with a certain material or a chemical or whatever it is, it's going to galvanize that surface and make it even more difficult to get through. So the fact, that, the fact that we're using a treadle setup type machine, we're turning it with my finger, a lot of people would be skeptical that we would be able to sew three layers of protected full grain leather. There are some motorized machines that can't sew through leather like this. But again, Barb's machine has been set up and optimized, so I don't think we'll have any difficulty to do it, to do it at all. We, we did it very easily off camera. Unless the machine is camera shy, then you never know. All right, presser foot is down. And again, if I didn't show this to you guys, let me see, the camera's a little bit too low. There we go. If I didn't show this to you guys before, I, I believe I did on, on the Japanese clone machine. But on this particular Class 66, they have a similar setup where this is your presser foot control right up here for increasing and decreasing. And what they do is they have a spring in there, so it's got a quick release. If you want to take away all the presser foot pressure, let's say you're trying to fit something 
extra thick underneath the presser foot and you can't quite fit it because the Class 66 doesn't have any hyperextension. And hyperextension again is when you grab that presser foot lever in the back and you push it up to its normal range of motion and then there might be a little bit more range that you can push it up to ab above that and it'll raise the presser foot a little bit higher. This one doesn't have that. So if you wanted to try to get more clearance for a real thick quilt or something like that, what you can do is just temporarily you can push this release right here and all of a sudden it'll spring up and take all the pressure off. Watch. So right now there's no presser foot pressure at all. So you don't want to try to sew right now because it's going to just create a mess. The, the material is not going to be moving at all. But let's say you're not sewing leather. Because with leather you want to have maximum presser foot pressure. But it, let's say we're sewing something more in the middle like uh, say heavy grade denim or something like that. Let's say we're mending some pants or something of that nature or a lighter grade type material. Then you can push this down in graduated fashions. There's a little bit more. A little bit more. More presser foot pressure. A little bit more. And then I go, oh, let's just stop goofing around. I know I want to do leather. I want to have maximum presser foot pressure. Then you just push it all the way down. Like so, okay? And then it's going to be able to feed that, those three layers of protected full grain leather uh, very, very nicely without getting what sometimes happens, and that is where you'll get one stitch that's a little bit longer, then you'll get another stitch that's a little bit longer. We want even length stitches all the way down. And that is a product of the feed, which is controlled by the presser foot pressure. So I'm gonna go ahead and start cranking it now. We'll go down and do a stitch line, and then we'll find out, did I, did I turn this upper tension back up far enough to accommodate the leather? If I didn't, what we'll see is the top stitch should look pretty bang on, but the lock stitch on the bottom will appear to be weak if I didn't turn it far enough. And again, that's a little bit of the challenge with any machine of this vintage, early 1900s, where they didn't have a numbered upper tension where you could say, oh, when I was sewing cotton, I was down on three, and now I wanna sew leather, and I wanna go up to eight, or something like that. Here, you're kinda of spitballing it a little bit. And the same thing on the stitch length, you're having to spitball a little bit because it's not numbered. But that's not a major obstacle. Once you get to know the machine, you figure out that rhythm, even though it's not numbered. And what some people do is they cheat a little bit and they'll actually take a Sharpie and they'll put a little mark on here where they wanna sew cotton. They might put a C and then they'll put an L down on the other end for leather. The only thing is then they have to remember, well, how many times did I turn it to get to that point? You know, is it two turns? Is it three turns? Is it four turns? What is it? So a little bit of, little bit of uh, hit and miss sometimes, but that's okay. So three layers of protected full grain leather. I'm going to go ahead and start cranking on it. And, uh, and eventually we'll see that lock stitch and we'll see how, how well I guessed getting it back to our starting point where I had it originally. And again, I'm doing this with my finger. So And when I hit that leather, let there be no mistake, that, that machine and that needle is telling me, you realize that we're going through three layers of protective full grain leather, dude? I'm actually gonna balance it. Remember the Class 66 machine does not set level. Uh, because of the engineering on the bottom, if I don't have, uh, I have one of my little furniture pads in the back to, to level off the machine. So if you see it rocking a little bit, that's because the machine doesn't sit level and you have to take one of those little furniture pads like this. If you want to use it on tabletop, these are available at Walmart or pretty much anywhere. They're actually designed as sliders where the leg of the furniture would sit on this part, the felt part, and then it's got a nice smooth surface on the bottom so you can bring it across, move that furniture across wooden floors and everything else, and it's not going to scratch the floor. But what I use them for is I, when I have a 66 like this or another machine, that doesn't sit level unless it's in a base or in a table, then I use this as the balancing point in the rear of the machine underneath one of those pedestal feet to put the machine so that it's nicely leveled. So 
if you've never tried that, that's that's what you can do. I've actually gone to my hand now because leather is never, when they cut it, is never exactly the same. And uh, I think I picked out three layers here that is even thicker than what I gave Barb to look at. So I, to get it done a little bit quicker, I'll use my hand instead of turning it with my finger. Okay, we're at the finish line. Now the big secret is we've got a really good looking top stitch, but how does our lock stitch look? Did I go far enough? And it looks like, looks like my guesswork was spot on. I should have counted how many times I turned it, but I didn't. I just kind of, I kind of guessed. I'll show this to Barb first, and this is really, really some good looking stitching. That's your top stitch. And even though this has a nap, go ahead and look at it real closely with the magnifier and you'll be able to see, see that stitching is also just perfectly balanced. And I didn't know if it would be that balanced because I kind of guessed how far to turn that upper tension back. It's got a universal needle in there right now. You could just as easily put uh, an embroidery needle. You could put uh, a denim needle in this machine. You can put pretty much any 15 by one needle in there, which is most needles that they sell anywhere are gonna be 15 by one. That's just the measurement of the needle. But uh, let, me, let me set this up on the display and let folks see what your machine just did. And it's not that I'm a superhero, you guys. It's just that this machine is just that good. When a machine doesn't have anything holding it back, even turned by hand or by finger, uh, you can go through ridiculously thick amounts of leather because the machine is optimized. And optimized means from bobbing the balance wheel, there's no, there's no crud, there's no buildup, there's nothing else that's gonna hold that machine back from being able to turn over very, very easily. So I'm going to go across here and Barb as the owner had a chance to see these before you and you can also type in the chat what you think. I'm already at a page 34 plus and page 34 plus means that is a drop dead gorgeous stitch. The spacing, the formation, the integrity of the stitch, everything about that stitch is just spot on. Also notice the edge right there, the three layers of protected full grain leather. Notice that the top stitch also has more than adequate uh, alignment as well, which means our bobbin case down below is strong enough to be able to pull that thread nice and taut and give us a nicely aligned stitch, just a beautifully aligned stitch. Turn over and look at the lock stitch. I'll come out totality of the stitching. And again, depending on the thread that you select, depending on the needle you select, right now we've got a size 9014 Schmetz Universal Needle. If we were using an embroidery needle or if we were using embroidery thread, we would get a very different look, uh, especially on the lighter materials. So that's another factor to consider as well. Right now we have dual duty Coates and Clark thread, which is more of a generalist type thread. I wouldn't say it's poor thread, uh, but it's it's certainly not it's not a Guterman type thread uh, made in Germany. So, but even in I mean even with more baseline type thread and a universal needle through three layers of protective full grain leather, which equates to about 14 ounces of leather, we have just a beautiful beautiful. Uh, stitch outcome. So let's turn it over now and look at that lock stitch. And then I'll get back by the camera and uh, we'll take a look at that again. 
And also I want to turn it towards you so you can see what Barb's machine went through with absolute ease. Now I'm going to zoom in straight away because of the nap on this protected full grain leather. We got to get pretty close and you could always pull it back as well to see that stitching even better. Beautiful lock stitching on there as well. Again, three layers of protected full grain leather, folks. Using a non-leather needle and basic dual duty type uh, thread. It would be fun to sew this uh, using an upholstery thread because then you would really get a nice emphasis of that lock stitch on the back overpowering the nap of that leather. I'm gonna come out a little bit and turn it towards you guys so you can see what Barb's machine just went through from a thickness standpoint. You know, me saying th three layers of protective full grain leather doesn't really get the message across. Look at that from the side. That's thicker than a man's belt, y'all. That's thicker than a man's belt. And we just did it with a combination of finger and hand power. So it gives you an idea what a machine is capable of when it's operating at the top of its game, right? All right, let's do one or two more sew-offs and then I will get this machine all set up to do cotton for uh, Barb. But I'm gonna throw this to the side right now. And she can always use this. All of these are gonna go with her. She can always use this uh, just to try it at home when she gets it set up in the treadle table. Because that is, uh, I'll tell you one thing, there's a lot of machines that have motors on them that wouldn't be able to do what her machine just did, powered by hand or powered by finger. So I think what I'll sew next is uh, some of this saddle grade leather that Emma sent me from Florida. Let's see, we'll do two layers of this. And remember, I'm turning this by hand, so I'm not gonna do a huge long sew off. We'll just kind of go down and get that set up for that type of sewing as well. But if you have a class 66 and maybe yours even has a motor on it and you try to duplicate something like this and your machine can't get it done, that should tell you right away that that machine needs some attention. And I've had customers contact me, they just got the machine serviced and they saw one of the videos where I was sewing something crazy like this and their machine couldn't do it. They turned around and sent it to the workshop and guess what? All of a sudden, their machine was able to do what they thought was impossible. So I'm going to start with just two layers of this uh, saddle grade leather. Matter of fact, I'll put it back to back so we don't have to try to look through that real nappy. See how nappy uh, saddle grade leather is? It'll make that lock stitch almost impossible to see. So we'll put these back to back. And then we might add a third layer. You never know. But you can see the thickness right now is right around six ounces of leather. So definitely not an easy task. Okay, so let's hand crank this one off too. I'll actually use my finger on this. It's not quite as thick as that protected full grain leather. A lot of people like the oscillating hook system too because it, it operates in completing the stitch cycle a little bit quieter than a rotary machine. Oh wow, that is gorgeous. I'll show it to the I'll show it to Barb first and then I'll show it to you guys and we might add a third layer to this. You never know. This is going to be the top stitch, and then the lock stitch is on the bottom.
bottom stitch almost disappears into the lemon. Well, and the solution for that, Barb is looking at this under magnification, and she said, you know what, it almost looks like that lock stitch might be disappearing, maybe getting pulled too hard. You could solve that, and I know you're already typing it in the chat. You could solve that. Maybe this is a little bit softer of a leather. Again, it's not. Saddle grade leather is not an easy leather to sew, but it doesn't have that galvanized surface like the protected full grain. Plus, we're only doing two layers of it. So if that stitch is getting pulled up a little bit too hard for the lock stitch, then all you have to do is back off that upper tension just a little bit. And that stitch will uh, will be pulled up a little bit less hard. It's like a tug of war. If you're brand new to VSM, that upper tension is pulling up. That bobbin case is pulling down. Well, you don't see any loops on either side, so that's good. All right. Well, I'm going to take it over by the camera, and, and I'll show it to the folks for the first time. Top stitch, I think. I lose track after a while. <laughs> no, I agree with you. I think our. <clears throat> I'll show you guys. Uh, I think that's an astute observation. Um, even as you change leather types, uh, you might have to make just a modest, tiny little tweak on that upper tension. Again, if that upper tension has too much muscle, and I've talked to you guys about this before, it can actually make that stitch, the lock stitch, a little bit shorter, a little bit stubbier. Still going to be a beautiful stitch, but it's not going to be as good as it could be. So this is our top stitch right now. Again, two layers of saddle grade leather. I'm going to pause right there. I'll tell you one thing, folks, that is a solid page 34, if not a solid page 34 plus. The formation, the spacing, the integrity of the stitch is just absolutely as it should be. Also you can see there's no tipping up of the stitch on the right side which would suggest that the bobbin case down below is losing the battle against the upper tension. Gorgeous, gorgeous stitching. Totality of the stitching, if you if you put that on a product, and again this is saddle grade leather, if you're making a wallet, if you're doing something else with your class 66 machine, that product is not going to be on the shelf long. That stitch is just absolutely, I think you would agree, is absolutely gorgeous. Let's turn over and look at that lock stitch and see if you make the same observation that Barb did. That's our lock stitch. So totality of the stitching, i got to get that turned just a little bit. Totality of the stitching gives you a real good impression of just how beautifully that machine is working. But if you get really close to that stitch and you compare it in your mind to the stitching on the other side, you're going to see while it's a beautiful looking stitch, it's a little bit compressed. I've talked about this numerous times in premieres. And compression happens when the tension either on top or the bottom, in this case the top tension, is turned up a little bit higher than it needs to be and what it's doing then is it's pulling up too hard and it's actually compressing the the length of that stitch just slightly so I'm I'm still at a page 34 with the stitching but we would make a slight adjustment and backing off that upper tension slightly so that we get the full length of that stitch, uh, the full length of that lock stitch. Beautiful stitching nonetheless, beautiful stitching. So there's the totality of the stitching. Again, if this were on a product, the presentation of the stitch, the beauty of the stitch, is just exactly what we want to be seeing. But again, we're committed to the Kanai principle. Barb, do you know what Kanai is? I'm giving I'm giving Barb an unfair test here. <laughs> I said, do you know what Kanai is? She's like, uh, no, no, I don't know what. 
Kanai is a thing that I use to uh, to say that we're constantly committed to improving things. Oh, you're talking about Kaizen? Uh, it's constant and never-ending improvement. Uh, C-A-N-I. It's some... Oh, is it? Okay. I, so. I remember Kaizen okay. from the Japanese, and that is exactly the definition that you just said. Well, we used to say it when I was working with General Motors many, many moons ago, and with Pepsi as well, and it was, it was saying that we would never become content or complacent because our competitors were never com compla you know, complacent or content. They were always trying to make things better. And so uh, when we talk about stitching, we say... That's a page 34 stitch, the, the formation, the integrity of the stitch, everything about it is just exactly right. But we can make it better. And sometimes it's by backing off the upper tension a little bit so that that lock stitch is not compressed slightly. Uh, sometimes it's by using a leather needle instead of a universal needle. Sometimes it's by changing out the thread and instead of having a dual duty thread, uh, putting on an upholstery thread or another type of thread that's going to be more complementary to that particular fabric or material that we're sewing. But I'll tell you one thing, that is a beautiful, beautiful stitch. Beautiful stitch. And again, if I kind of tip it to the camera, you can see not nearly as thick as the protected full grain leather, not even close. But again, remember that the grade of leathers is gonna change when you go from one to another. Italian leather is gonna be a little bit more slippery, more tricky to sew than a lot of other leathers. They're all gonna have characteristics and quality that make them unique and different. But again, as we look at this top stitch, that most often is going to be, if you're doing this as a product, that's going to be the stitch that is going to take you to the bank with your customers. But uh, the end result is, whether it's the protected full grain leather, three layers, or the two layers of saddle grade leather, we've got a beautiful, beautiful stitch output from this. And I'm saying this with a smile you can't see on the camera right now with this either 1911 or 1923 machine because our database is not in agreement there but uh, beautiful stitching again on the saddle grade leather you've already seen that but you can hang on to it because you're going you're gonna to be able to take that home and stitch it again if you'd like okay. and again as far as how easy this machine is turning either by hand or by finger that was easy very very easy I'm, I'm turning it with no effort whatsoever Now the last sew-off that I'm going to do is going to be Genuine Elk Hide. Any of you that follow me very closely are very, very familiar with Elk Hide. And uh, again, depending on where they, where they get the leather from the hide, it's going to vary in thickness. This is going to be around 3 ounces of leather. But again, remember that Elk Hide is chemically processed. It's chemically processed in a different way than protected full grain leather but it's processed with chemical which galvanizes the surface. So three ounces of genuine elk hide is the equivalent of probably six ounces of genuine cowhide. It's, it's that big of a difference because of how they, how they galvanize the surface through the chemical treatment. And any of you that are hunters, I don't happen to be a hunter, but my dad was, uh, whether it was elk hide or snake skin or anything like that, as soon as they would give it a chemical bath, right away it would toughen up that leather and you know right away when leather is toughened up it, it raises the piercing threshold quite a bit so uh, we'll see if I can turn this by finger I think I'll be able to do it but if not uh, I'll turn it by hand I'll come out here a little bit so you can watch me work and I think I'm going to Cut this down just a little bit, otherwise I'm going to be turning forever. So give us a small triangle and we'll just kind of go down and around. So I'm going to try to demonstrate even, even awkwardly turning this by hand when it's not mounted in a table. Uh, I'm going to try to control it as best as I can with one hand and turning this with my finger with my hand will kind of go down around the edges and see if we can have some, some good control as well with the machine. Alright, here we go.
and I might, because this is elk hide, um, let's see, two layers, we just did protected full grain leather, two layers, our lock stitch was a little bit on the heavy side, I'm kind of rolling the dice here folks, two layers of protected full grain leather versus a single layer of elk hide, um, I'm going to back it off just about a millimeter, not much. And hopefully I don't steal too much away from that lock stitch. All right, here we go. This is tougher to get through, I can tell you that right now. I'm going to turn it by hand. Otherwise, we'll be here until tomorrow. I'm going to cheat and make this turn now. And I tell you already, I'm seeing a, a, a rock solid top stitch, which tells me that that bobbin case has enough pull. You know, that foot is tilted right now that's not the ideal way to launch but because we're already into the leather we're going to just kind of we, sh we should get very good traction plus we have enough presser foot pressure that we won't slip but if you were using this as a motorized machine where it it, it, it has a little bit more kick uh, at launch uh, you may run into a problem trying to trying to continue launching when that presser foot is up like that it's not even I think we'll be just fine Kind of pushing that leather a little bit to see if I can make the turn. I don't think I'm going to quite make it. We'll have a little bit of an open gate at the bottom, but that's okay. Yeah, we're spot on. That looks really good. I'm glad I backed off that upper tension a little bit. But again, if you don't sew a ton of this stuff, you might have to... You might have to just kind of make some subtle adjustments and try it again. And then once you get that sweet spot, you'll have success every time you sew that material, as long as your needle isn't getting uh, too dull. Yeah, that was definitely the right, the right move. I'll let Barb look at it now, but that was definitely the right move, backing off that upper tension just, just about a millimeter so that it wasn't stubbing out those uh, stitches on the bottom. And again, we've done a fair amount of sewing on this needle already, so we're getting some real good results for a needle that's gotten a fair amount of work out already. Seems to do a great job on leather. You're going to become a leather worker now. <laughs> Looks good. All right, so let's take a look at it over here by the machine now. We're going to look at the top stitch first. This is a small enough piece we can almost see the totality of the stitching and see the stitching very nicely. So when it comes to stitching like this we're looking at the evenness of the stitches, we're looking at the fact that we can't see the knot. Of course this is going to be thicker than two layers of uh, genuine cotton 
And uh, we're also looking for the integrity and the presentation of the stitch. We're on a page 34, if not a page 34 plus on all of those measurements. And look at again from the edge there what we just went through. Go down and around now, look at that stitching as well. Look at that edge, you guys. Again, this is protected, this is not protected full grain, this is uh, genuine alkyd, but again, it's been chemically processed. For us to be able to do this out of the treadle table is really nothing short of miraculous. But it just goes to show you when a machine is set up and it's fully optimized, it can do crazy things that machines, even with a motor, wouldn't be able to do. And we're doing it by hand right now, literally by hand or by finger. So let's take a look at that lock stitch now. I think you're going to notice, unlike the protected full grain leather, where Barb made the astute observation that it was... It looked like it was a little bit, it was being pulled up too hard is what she said. And that's because that upper tension was muscling it too hard. I backed it off just about a millimeter and look at the fullness of the stitch come back. Again, we're looking at two different leathers now. We're looking at a single layer of alkyd versus two layers of protected full grain leather or three layers of, uh, no, two layers of uh, saddle grade leather, three layers of protected full grain leather. But nonetheless, Elkite is Elkite, folks. Beautiful full stitch, presentation, no tipping of the stitch, which means we're getting adequate upper tension. And our top stitch was also absolutely spot on. And again, we're working with a slightly tired needle, but it's still performing beautifully with this leather doing a beautiful job. What's the what's the history on this uh, machine? Is, does it is it a family machine, Barb, or what's the no, would you, I bought it at an antique shop years and years ago. So you've had it in your family for quite a while then. Mm -hmm. Waiting to be refurbished so I could use it without feeling like the cabinet was going to collapse under it. Okay, so you you redid the cabinet too then? Haven't yet. Okay. I'm still trying to find that craftsman that does that kind of work, and they're harder than hen's teeth to find. You know, I'm doing a project right now. It's it's a different model than this. It's an earlier model. Um, it came the class class 27 model came out before the class 66. Singer actually did something logical there, like okay, 27 is smaller than 66, so I'm assuming it's earlier. Well, they did. They followed logic there. Uh, but that one is actually that the cabinet is being refinished down in Texas and then I'm working for the cabinet restorer by doing the machine up here and then I'm going to send it back to Texas and they're going to be joined together and then given to his customer. So, but I know there are cabinet workers in this area. I've done some cabinet work, but I don't enjoy it. So you got, you got to love what you do. Um, otherwise it's, it's no fun. And I love working on machines and... The fruits of that labor are uh, are evident as you're looking at Barb's machine now on the workbench. Yes, I want the cabinet to match the beauty of that machine. And I've never taken a cabinet totally apart, but I'm getting closer and closer to picking up that screwdriver. <laughs> I don't blame you. I don't blame you. I wanted to try and see if I could find a craftsman first, because they're supposed to know what they're doing. Well, some of them do, some of them don't, so... But... At any rate, this is, uh, this is Barb's Class 66 from 1911-23, because the database doesn't agree, but I'm going to say a 1911 machine for our purposes at least. Uh, and then as a backup, we could always say, well, they, they spent so much time making this machine so beautiful, guess what? They started working on it in 1911, and they took 12 years to get it done, which is why they got two serial numbers. <laughs> I don't know if anybody will buy that, but that's we're sticking to that. So, All right. Well, you all take care. I'm going to get this set up uh, specifically 
uh, to accommodate. Uh, and I'll actually show you something real quick so my viewers will understand what I'm going to do off camera. Got to pull it, pull one of these out of here. Should have one in here. I do. So instead of, you can imagine with these drop-in bobbins, and just ignore the fact that the bobbin I'm going to show you is for a class 15 machine, <clears throat> but in my left hand over here is what you would traditionally think of as far as a bobbin, right? Or a bobbin carrier. You put the bobbin inside of here, you then snap it inside of the machine. And uh, this, this bobbin carrier can be adjusted. See, it's got a screw right there that as you turn it down, it's going to be pulling down harder to give you a, a more defined top stitch. But on this model, this Class 66 with the drop-end bobbin, it's going to have a setup more like this. <laughs> Once you know out of, out of the workbench, I pulled one that's missing the screw. But imagine that there is a screw in there. That screw that's missing is going to be your adjustment screw. That's your set screw that holds that band on to the bobbin carrier that sets into the machine like this, right? Actually, let me turn it the other way. I'm just totally dyslexic today. So it sets in the, the machine kind of like this, okay? And again, this, this screw right here, this screw right here is missing. That would be your adjustment screw, okay? This is your set screw. So as you turn this clockwise, it's gonna tighten that band more. It's gonna define that top stitch more. As you turn it counterclockwise, it's gonna loosen that band a little bit more as the thread is passing underneath it, which means it's going to take away the emphasis of that top stitch, okay? So it's just another, it's another setup that's different, obviously, than a traditional type bobbin case. And bobbin cases come in all forms. This again is a class 15 bobbin case versus a class 66 bobbin case that uh, mounts into the raceway. So I'll just show those to, to Barb if she's curious to see them. This is what your machine has. And this would just be a, more of a traditional bobbin case. All right, you guys. Well, as we listen to this fun little French tune, off camera, what I'm going to do once we end this premiere is I'm going to be taking her bobbin carrier that actually has a set screw in it and an adjustment screw, and I'm going to be turning that adjustment screw in the machine, which is accessed by just opening this plate right here, and then you see this little notch. I'll kind of zoom in on that notch. That little notch is designed for a screwdriver to slide into it like this. So you can reach that screw and in our case we're going to be turning it clockwise. So we can have a little bit more pull down from that bobbin case, okay? So that's it folks. This 1911 slash 1923 machine that is so rocking cool it took 12 years to make the sucker. And if you believe that, I do have a bridge to sell you in Wisconsin. I have one. You have one too? <laughs> well, thank you, Barb, for coming to the workshop. We'll get this set up for cotton sewing. And uh, you can take this beautiful machine home to join that cabinet once it gets done. All right, y'all. Stay tuned for other premieres. Take care. God bless you. Bye.